is on our Facebook page. So that's at Higher Heights 4. Or for Kareen, who's of course going to share hers, it's on <laughs> at Move On. <laughs> So good afternoon, my name is Glenda Carr, uh, President and CEO of Higher Heights, and we're so excited today, um, almost a year out from um, the November 2020 election cycle to um, release uh, a report that uh, Higher Heights Leadership Fund and the Center for American Women in Politics has been compiling since uh, Kimberly Peeler Allen and I founded Higher Heights uh, in a Brooklyn cafe. And so we thought it was important, the first um, project that we launched with the Center for American Women in Politics was that to be able to develop a blueprint to ensure that black women's voices, votes, and leadership truly matter in this democracy is we needed to know where we have been, where do we <laughs> where do we come from? <laughs> come, where are we? And then where where can we go? And so this report highlights um, the strides black women have made in elected leadership, but it also um, shows um, that there's a lot of work to be done. And so on the 50th anniversary of Shirley Chisholm being sworn in to Congress this past January as the first black woman to ever serve in that body, we celebrate the gains, um, but we recognize that uh, research points to that black women still face man-made barriers and institutional obstacles um, for them to truly realize their leadership potential on elected offices from the top of the ticket all the way down. And so this report will share a little bit about by the numbers, and we have an amazing panel, two panels, to be able to discuss the implications of black women's political power and leadership as relates to policies that directly affect black women, our families, and our nation. And then... Uh, we are on the road to 2020, and as you are aware, the road to 2020 is powered by black women. Uh, and so we'll have a conversation about the political climate and how black women can truly um, re um, demand our return our, on our voting investment in the form of policies that affect us and leadership roles in a, elected office across the country. So I'm excited to introduce our research partner, Dr. Kelly Dittmar. She's the Assistant Professor of Political Science at Rutgers University um, and a scholar at the Center for American Women in Politics at the Eagleton Institute of Policies. So we are trying technology today, so she is being Skyped in because it's the last day of class for some of her <laughs> students. Yes. Well, thank you, Glenda, and thanks for, for letting me participate virtually. Um, my students would have loved to cancel class, but um, I did want to be a part of this conversation and look forward to hearing the rest of the conversation. Um, thanks to Higher Heights for being a fabulous partner in this since 2014. I think this work is really important. Um, and I just want to highlight just a couple main takeaways from the report, but I hope you'll all uh, read it in full and help, help us get the word out there in terms of not only the data, but the implications of the data. Um, so we know that the 2018 elections were sort of record year. We heard a lot about a wave year for women, broadly speaking, um, and there were was a lot of history made as well for black women in politics. Black women shared in the successes that other particularly Democratic women did in 2018 um, and also contributed significantly as voters to those successes. Um, so as we look ahead to 2020, sort of taking stock of what happened in 2018 and where we're at in 2019 is important so that we can sort of, again, uh, think about how we clear the persistent hurdles to getting closer to full representation for black women in American politics. So the update that we released today outlines the status of black women in American politics as of uh, December, uh, basically one year ahead of the 2020 election. And so let me just hit on a couple of those numbers. So we know black women are about 7.6% of the U.S. population, according to the U.S. Census, but today they hold less than 5% of offices at the statewide elected executive level, the congressional level, and the state legislative level. Um, Today we have 23 black women in Congress plus our two uh, non-voting delegates. That equates to 4.3% of all members of Congress. And that's a record number for black women, but again, still less than that 7.6%. Um, in terms of state legislatures, the percentage is the same. 4.3% of all state legislators are black women. We actually saw the largest gain that we've ever seen at COP since we've been keeping numbers on race and gender since 1994 for black Black women at the state legislative level through the 2018 elections. So again, a really notable success that we want to celebrate, 
but still um, at under representation if we look at the percentage uh, today. And then in terms of our statewide elected executive offices, uh, today, as of today, after yesterday's uh, change, because Janine Hampton is no longer the lieutenant governor of Kentucky as of yesterday, um, today we have five black women in statewide elected executive office. In the report, we talk about the number six because for most of 2019, that was the case. Either way, it's less than 2% of those offices. Um, and to give you a little bit more of the history here in the context, a number that I think is particularly particularly striking and shows the sort of recent history for black women in statewide executive leadership is that only 15 women have ever served in statewide elected executive office in 13 states um, in U.S. history. And so this is a place where we have seen a lot of gains in recent years. Um, most of the gains, most of the women currently serving, right, have, have taken office in recent years, but a place where we need to see a lot more growth. And I think that has implications when we're talking about presidential shortlists um, running for governor. And as you all know, um, as of today, we still have had no uh, black woman governor. Um, so... Some other positives from the election. Um, we obviously had the first black woman nominee for governor in 2018. Um, so even though uh, Stacey Abrams may not be serving today, she really broke through both at the nomination stage and then I think also proved um, electability, um, pushing back against concerns that a black woman couldn't win statewide, especially in a state like Georgia. Um, she won more votes than any other Democrat uh, ever, and she won greater percentage of votes than any other Democratic nominee since the late 90s. Um, the women in Congress who won uh, also push back against electability concerns that they couldn't win in majority white districts, which has been a hurdle sometimes placed in front of black women even before they get out of the gates as candidates. Four of five of the women, the black women who were elected to Congress for the first time in 2018 won in majority white districts. Again, pushing back against any uh, doubts or biases that they are not electable in those places. Um, and we also saw the first black women elected from three different states to Congress. Congress, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Minnesota as a result of the 2018 election, and the first black women elected statewide in New York um, and to statewide executive office in Illinois. So a lot of important milestones. But as I mentioned, the report goes through some of the persistent barriers we saw. Um, we still, in 2018, had no black women nominees for the U.S. Senate, um, a place where only two black women have ever served. Um, and we, we knew and heard from black women running that they still had to um, do extra work um, to prove to insiders, parties, et cetera, that they could win. They obviously proved many people wrong um, in being so successful in the election, um, but we've got a lot more work to do to prevent them from having to do that work in the first place and also to get closer to parity in the numbers. And I think our organizations are mutually committed and working together to do that, to use this data to identify and look for persistent hurdles and then also clear them so that our next update uh, shows a, a closing of the gap in terms of black women's representation in the population and what we see in our elected leaders. So thanks for giving me a few minutes to sort of lay that out, but I, I really look forward to the conversation to sort of hashing out why these numbers are where they are and how we can get them uh, even closer uh, to full representation. Thank you, Kelly. You're welcome. Um, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing the woman that is going to move the conversation along, uh, as well as keep us on time. <laughs> um, our moderator this afternoon, well, are we in afternoon yet? After, more, we're still morning. Morning. Uh, Karen Finney, um, a political strategist, an amazing um, communication strategist, and um, commentator of CNN and a huge um, addition to our work at Higher Heights this year. So we're excited uh, to welcome Karen Finney, who will be the moderator of our next two panels. And friend. Oh, yeah, I should have, and friend. <laughs> or this, what this is going to be is uh, a sister girl conversation with amazing thought leaders from across the country. If you're watching this live, follow us. Um, it's at Move On and at Higher Heights, and the hashtag Black Women Lead. Do you want to stand there or sit here? Okay, all right, yes. All right, thank you. 
I do whatever Glenda says. So, um, Well, thanks, everyone. I'm so excited to be a part of this conversation. I actually was a senior advisor also to Stacey Abrams' race um, in 2018. And like Hillary Clinton, she actually won. It's just that few little things got in the way of the count. So that's one of the things we'll talk about because we need to fix that as well. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, our first panel, starting with Judith Brown Dianis, who is the Executive Director of the National uh, Advancement Project. And we have Melanie Rousseau Newman, Senior Vice President of Communications and Culture, Planned Parenthood Federation of America, and Planned Parenthood Action Fund. And Jocelyn Fry, Senior Fellow, Center for American Progress. Am I missing anyone? No, that's our. Uh, am I missing anyone, Glenda? Yes. Corinne Jean Pierre. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> She's not on this list. She's on a different list. Um, you know, general badass. I don't know. Can I say that, can I say that on the internet? I think I can. <laughs> it's safe on the internet. I think. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> She's also an MSNBC contributor. And I think senior advisor at Move On. That's yeah. cool. That's good. Okay, we'll go with that. We go with that. We'll, we'll go with that. <laughs> All right. So I want to start to frame this conversation a little bit, but I think you know we've heard the numbers about where we are uh, with women, and one of the things I think uh, I know Higher Heights is very conscious of is that so we had this amazing outcome in 2018, and that we elected many so many more Black and Brown women. But now, I think these numbers are great, but behind those numbers is a couple things, and I want to get y'all's take on this. We have to defend those seats. We have to make sure those women are re-elected so that nobody can say that was just a fluke. I think that's important. And expand those numbers where we can. Um, and I think also just, again, behind those numbers, it is a challenge. Getting elected is a challenge, but then being in office is a challenge. So how do we, so where are, from your perspective, where are we, and how do we build on those gains coming up in this election based on what we learned in 2018 or other factors? And I'm going to start with Kareen. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, you hit it right on. In 2018, we had enormous gains, um, but there's still a lot of work to do. And, um, and I think it took organizations like Higher Heights and others uh, to make sure these women were able, black women were able to have the resources they needed. Because a lot of it is making sure they're able to raise the money, um, which is one of the biggest heavy lifts when you think about getting women of color, black women, to run for office. And, um, and so that is uh, one of the major hurdles as we look into their reelection. Um, and, uh, and I think the other part of it, too, is I've been doing a lot of travel across the country, and I've been to Georgia, I've been to St. Louis, I've been everywhere, and um, it's also encouraging women to run. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's always a little bit of fear about doing that because, how, yeah, you tell somebody to run, and how does that work? Mm -hmm. And um, I think organizations have making sure that there is training tools out there that helps uh, helps women understand that this is if you want to run, this is how you do it. So it's the getting folks to run, understanding that they can do it, and and giving them the funding and helping them raise the funding. And I, that's the biggest, biggest hurdle. I mean, we saw that most recently in the 2020 primary with Kamala Harris, the funding there. Mm -hmm. uh, this is someone who was a tier one candidate and had, you know, should have had, was considered someone who would easily have gotten the, the nomination or should have gotten the nomination or could have gotten the nomination, probably better to say. And money was a big factor. Um, and so I know organizations like ours, we have, uh, being a large progressive organization, that is primarily white in membership. We have really tried to make our members understand that having diversity, having black women at the table is really important. And we've raised, in 2018, we raised over uh, a million million dollars to do that to help in like candidates like Stacey Abrams and others so we have to continue that process mm -hmm. anyone else want to weigh in on that question about where we are and what does it take 
feel yeah. like you covered it. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> she, that's why she gets paid the big bucks. Oh, <laughs> to do the analysis, <laughs> political analysis. Yeah. Um, what about from the perspective uh, for Planned Parenthood in terms of finding, helping uh, black women who are pro-choice candidates? So, uh, I think what we what we saw in 2018 was a was a, a, a sweep of, of people of color, women of color in particular, into Congress and and sweep of state houses. And then in 2019 in Virginia, uh, we saw a sweep and we protected some seats in Virginia. Uh, and these are area these are areas Virginia and Kentucky, for example, where our opposition spent a lot of money trying to make the issue of abortion access the key issue in those races and we were able to protect those seats. I think for women of color, uh, making sure that they have the tools, the infrastructure, all the things uh, Corrine made, all the points Corrine made about tools, infrastructure, access, but also the information uh, to reach co the target communities, right? And making sure that uh, we, we have the messaging for target communities. What we know is that 77% of Americans support Roe v. Wade, but 80% of African Americans believe that abortion should be legal, regardless of how they, their mm -hmm. personal views. Mm -hmm. And abortion access in, in the black community is critical to a economic security. Mm -hmm. It's critical to, um, to, to ensuring that people have access to the lives we want to create. And Planned Parenthood Action Fund is supporting those candidates, but there are also a number of reproductive justice organizations in the ground, on the ground in states like Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, who are organizing black women and organizing for candidates, really paving the way to ensure that rep, rep, uh, reproductive justice is a critical issue and that we have uh, candidates who are supporting not only uh, not overturning Roe, but repealing the Hyde Amendment, mm -hmm. which has kept access yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. away from right. women of color for so long. Mm -hmm. And so we support those reproductive justice organizations. We lift them up uh, all above all um, uh, in our own voice, Sister Song. These are, these are black women mm -hmm. who have really been leading the charge and the Planned Parenthood Action Fund works very closely with them to lift them up and support them in that work. Mm -hmm. So just touching on that, because I think, you know, there are stereotypes about what issues are going to resonate with black women voters uh, and or uh, candidates. And I say that because in Stacy's race, initially, there were some questions about, you know, was she going to be a progressive liberal? Was she going to be conservative? And, you know, and I literally had some white reporters, not from uh, Georgia, say, well, she's, you know, a churchgoer, she's black, and she lives in the South. She must be pretty conservative on the social issues. Yeah. And I was like, she's not. okay, you're not a black woman, so you have no idea what our <laughs> lives are like. Um, but I, I think this is an important point. You know, Jocelyn, I'm going to come to you because I think the issue landscape has changed a lot more. I think, like, health care is actually a mainstream mm -hmm. issue. It is not a liberal mm -hmm. issue anymore. Um, and how do we frame the issues uh, for black women? Because the other side of the coin here, as Glenda pointed out and as the data shows, is getting women to vote is really important. Um, and so I wonder if you would talk a little bit about that. Sure. I, I I think I want to piggyback on something that Melanie said because she made the connection between reproductive justice and economic justice. Mm -hmm. And what we know about black women, like, like other women as well, is that they vote on issues that matter to them. Um, it's not enough simply to say, come out and vote. We know that black women are the most reliable voters, but they come out because they want specific policies uh, addressed and they want to hear that from uh, candidates. And what we know is that black women don't live single issue lives. Um, all of these uh, issues connect together. Their health care connects to their economic stability. Uh, more than 80% of black mothers are either co, sole, or primary breadwinners for their mm -hmm. families. Um, black women consistently earn less than their white female counterparts, white men, black men. Um, so there are some basic economic issues um, that black women care about. But they won't just say it's just about equal pay. 
right? They, I mean, equal right. pay is important, but they'll also say it's important the cost of health care, mm -hmm. the cost of child care, mm -hmm. my ability to, to get from my home to my work. Like all of those things factor together because more often than not, they are pulling all of those pieces together. Mm -hmm. um, so it's important for us to think about um, issues about, you know, equal pay, to be sure, paid family leave, paid sick days, all of those things that support women who are caregivers, all of those things are important. But we also have to look at those policies through the lens of women of color um, and look at them as not simply gender issues, but gender and race issues. Um, because we often know that they are experiencing even more deficits because of racism and sexism. And if we're not conscious and tackling those problems head on, even the solutions that we come up with may not work for them. So I want to um, piggyback on something that Corrine said and talk a little bit about, I feel like in 2020, viability and electability mm -hmm. is sort of code, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, for likability, and which likeability. they sort of start, yeah. I mean, that's been yeah. the wrap on women for a long time, right? She's not likable. And certainly in this cycle, I think what we saw was they sort of tried that on Elizabeth Warren, and I think a lot of people jumped on it very quickly. And so now, Judith, you know I'm coming to you. It was more of now there's, it's sort of, well, is she electable? And that is really an issue black women candidates, in addition to just raising money and start getting the resources to just get to the starting line, this, you know, then we face, the, I mean, I, you know, people told Stacey, no way, no how, not going to happen. Uh, same thing for Barack Obama. Same thing for a lot of uh, our house can house women. So what, how do we com combat this electability, li really likability conversation? Uh, how do we help our black women candidates? And how do we help them succeed? Because the other side of it is once they're in office, we have to make sure, again, that they stay. Yeah, that's um, a hard question, right? Because yeah. it's about <laughs> society in general and the way that the media mm -hmm. portrays um, women and women of color in yep. particular. And you think about like women, black women in particular, being the angry black woman. Mm -hmm. um, you think of Kamala as the lawyer, right? Very smart, very stern, can cross-examine anyone, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But that being seen as not being likable mm -hmm. um, instead of it being, wow, she's a really smart, astute lawyer who I would love to have cross-examining anyone, including Trump, right? Uh, so, right, <laughs> she will get to do that, yeah. I promise. Um, so I think, um, I, so I think the, the issue, though, is for black women voters, right, who see themselves in those candidates being able to kind of cut through that BS, right, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, around likability. Um, but I do think that any woman, um, especially black women, are going to come up against that, whether it's the way that they're dressed, right? The pantsuit nation, right? Yeah. Or yeah. if it is the way that they wear their hair, or, I mean, this is just patriarchy, right? It's like what we have to deal with um, as women in this country. And I, I do think that um, black women who are running for office, especially at the local level, that women, black women are seeing themselves in them. And also that the black women who are running are saying, you know, hey, what about me? Like, I think this is the thing that is really exciting to me is that more black women are saying, I can do this. Mm -hmm. yes. um, yep. And so that they're not kind of getting caught up in the barriers, but trying to figure it out because they see mm -hmm. that other women are doing it. And they're like, okay, well, what about me? They yeah. see a Congresswoman Fudge right. yeah. who is, you know, a badass, <laughs> right? And they're like, I I'm a badass too. I want to be I like do her. This. Yep. So I, just, I think it's that so we're going to see more women as like it becomes just something common that we do and that we're able to raise our voices around the issues that matter matter to us. Yeah. So actually, uh, I'm going to build on that and throw this back to Melanie and Jocelyn, because one of the things that strikes me is, um, you know, given a lot of the madness we've seen, particularly at the state level, uh, particularly around reproductive freedom, uh, has, is, I mean, we now I think people are making the connection about how important the state legislative races are, because I think for, you know, a lot of times we focus on the presidency and we focus on Congress, but a lot is going on. Um, my, I'm going to take a little moment of pride. Tish James is my cousin. You know, being the state yeah. attorney general of New York is a very She's powerful yeah. position and allows yeah. you to yeah. do some really yeah. important things. Yeah. So when we look at the gains we're making, and Virginia was a great example, at the state level in terms of legislative races, 
I wonder, I'd love you guys to comment on that and, uh, and talk a little bit about, like, is it reproductive freedom? Is that part of what motivates people to say, all right, this is crazy. These men don't know what they're talking about. Right. And the economic issues where, again, this idea that things just aren't getting done. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things about women's leadership that we know is people see us as collaborative leaders. And so running for Congress mm -hmm. is great because that fits into, in terms of the biases we have to deal with, at least that is uh, constructive to what they already expect women to be able to do, a lot of voters expect women to be able to do. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit about those legislative races and those seats, because that's so important, and it's hard. <laughs> sure, and I think it's layered too, right? So All Above All did a recent, uh, released a poll recently that found that 68% of African American women voters feel that the country is headed in the wrong direction mm -hmm. on abortion access. So the concern is there. Uh, but when you look at, uh, I think when women see what happened in Alabama, 25 white men passed this e mm -hmm. very extreme abortion uh, ban, uh, banning abortion at any stage, criminalizing doctors for up to 99 years. Uh, when you see who's making the decisions, and how those decisions are getting made, um, we're seeing that as a mobilizing force. But overlaying that is the effects of gerrymandering, right? Mm -hmm. And so in a state like Alabama, in Alabama uh, the legislature has been gerrymandered to achieve, uh, con to consolidate power in such a way that limits access for the black voters in that state, and it's happened. Mm -hmm. It's happened yeah. all across the country, uh, and there. And that is, you know, the importance mm -hmm. of efforts uh, like the National Redistricting uh, Commission or committee that Eric Holder is running to really address that. And and lots of people are doing that work, uh, looking at redistricting. Um, and so it's important to get to get a, a different Congress in 2020 right. to get census results that help lead us in the opposite direction so that we can continue to move those legislative districts. But it's not just legislative districts, right? The district attorneys, the attorneys general mm -hmm. are going to be the ones prosecuting if Roe falls and these laws uh, come to pass. Uh, the Democratic Association of Attorneys Generals recently announced that they are no longer going to support candidates who don't support access to reproductive freedom. Uh, and that's a really big announcement and show and, and, and getting that particular organization of prosecutors who will be the ones making the pro they have a huge amount of discretion right. so the, the state legislature can pass the ban mm -hmm. somebody's got to somebody's got to prosecute it and so making sure that at every level w black women black voters see the impact of their vote mm -hmm. reflected mm -hmm. and understand who the decision makers are and and that we're focusing on the census and, and trying to uh, undo the damage that was done af after 2010. Right. So I just wanted to add to yeah, that, I, I, this issue of the local elections. Um, so it's, you know, it's not just congressional. I mean, what part of what we should be thinking about for 2020 is whether or not people are actually going to vote up ballot, right? Mm -hmm. Because their bread and butter issues are the local races. Mm -hmm. um, and prosecutors in particular, we know that black women and black community generally has criminal justice as yeah. one of the That's top right. issues right. that is a motivator for black folks. And that is the DA. Who is your local DA? And mm -hmm. who's your sheriff? Um, in places like Florida, for example, there's 67 counties and all of the sheriffs are up for election in 2020. And so I think that black women are going to be honing in on those on those positions because it's not just criminal justice, but it's also the issues around violence in our mm -hmm. communities that black women do care about. Jonathan? Well, you know, I'll, I'll piggyback on that because, I, you know, I agree that the local elections are important for a lot of reasons, uh, not the least of which is educating voters. But it's also where a lot of important change is happening. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, particularly when you look at some of the economic security policies, when you look at things like equal pay, paid leave, even work around sexual harassment, minimum wage, a lot of those changes are happening in local communities across those co the country. And that's really critical. That change is important to the people in those communities in terms of raising wages and ensuring that they have access to uh, protections around sexual harassment and, and so forth. And if enough of those local um, communities make changes, it also boosts the case for that 
policy change at the national level. Mm -hmm. So it's important for women to be engaged at all levels, um, but it's particularly important if we really want to see um, change occurring in a way that people feel it in their pocketbooks. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to piggyback on that and ask the panel just a general question, which is how, what's different when a black woman is at the table in terms of how decisions get made or what decisions get made? And how do we make sure that voters understand that connection? Because when I look at the data from this wonderful report, mayor, you know, mayors, state legislative races, statewide races, Congress, it's clear that, again, we, we made great gains, but we got to get everybody reelected and we got to get more in there. So, how, And I do think to what Jocelyn just said, it's so important that people feel like, mm -hmm. um, you know, their vote mattered. Mm -hmm. And I do think, and I'm going to ask Congresswoman Fudge this question on the second panel, which is, you know, just as black women face, you know, you have to be 10 times better in everything, particularly when you're running, it's 10 times harder when you're elected. Mm -hmm. And I think, you, you know, and to prove that you being there made a difference and people were right to come out and support you so that we keep getting these great numbers. Yeah. Um, so a couple of things. Um, Black women are just as likely to get reelected as white men, and that's that's the the thing to re to remember. And you know, I was just we were just talking about the local issues and what matters, and making sure we go out to vote. Another thing that matters is voter suppression and voter yeah. ID laws, yeah. and how much that's affecting our vote because mm -hmm. that is suppressing black, brown people who are poor. That's that's what that's about. It's because the other side is cheating. They know that they know that if we come out. You know, it's going to be big, huge wins for the Democratic side. And so that is happening across the board. We saw the effects of it in Wisconsin in 2016. Yeah. We saw it in 2017 to 2018 in certain states. And it's going to come up again in, uh, in 2020. And I know the House has, the, the Democratic House has tried very hard to make sure that that isn't the case and that we can fix it, but we know what's happening in the Senate. Um, so that is, I think, something that we cannot forget, voter suppression, voter ID laws. Yeah. Um, and what? how does it change when you have a black woman at the table? You mentioned somebody that was perfect, Tish James, in, in New York as an <laughs> attorney general. Look what she is doing. She's holding people accountable. She has made historical cases that will change everyone's lives, whether it's the opioid crisis, whether it's holding Donald Trump accountable. It is amazing to watch her move and ride. And I work for her, uh, so I'm very proud of, of the work that she's doing. And you think about Ayanna Presley and what she's doing and the things that they've moved forward and Lauren Underwood, like these young, um, young uh, black women who have jumped into the fray uh, in the house and are pushing issues that really, I think about infant mortal mortality and how that affects maternal mortality, maternal, maternal, I'm sorry, yeah. maternal mortality mm -hmm. how that affects black women in particular uh, yeah. and now there's a commission in, in Congress. There's a law that passed in California a, because women, black women were at the table. Exactly mm -hmm. and because black women were at the table. So um, up and down statewide, federal, federal locally uh, you see, uh, you see the difference when Black women have a voice, and not just a voice, but at the table making the change. Mm -hmm. So, Judith, you know I can't let you out of here without talking about voter suppression. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you mentioned that. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> you know, since it, it came up. <laughs> yeah, but this is a, you know, this is a serious issue. I, you know, made a little bit of a joke about what we saw in Georgia last cycle. It was blatant. I mean, they weren't even trying to hide it. You know, we had one district where. People were waiting four hours in line for two machines, and in that same district there was a warehouse full of machines, wrapped, ready to go, and they wouldn't release them. Uh, that also goes to, again, why statewide races are so important, secretaries of state, governors, that really matters and how the laws are made uh, to, you know, in terms of our voting. But talk a little bit about kind of the landscape of where we are right now. Um, because I think that's going to be critical, obviously, in 2020. It's great to have good candidates, got to mobilize everybody to get them to vote, but then they got to be able to vote and have that vote counted. Well, of course, um, after the Supreme Court decision in Shelby County case, which kind of gutted the Voting Rights Act, we've seen the immersion of a number of states, 23 states, passing voter suppression laws. Um, over the past year, um, Congress, including Congresswoman Fudge, have led, she led the effort to collect more stories about what is happening on voter suppression. And just last week, um, the House passed the Voting Rights Advancement Act. Um, and as was said, it is going 
to be dead on arrival in the Senate unless we push, push, push. And even if we push, it'll start, probably still be dead. So I think um, really what this boils down to is in a place like Georgia, um, you know, you see the local secretary of state doing all those kinds of shenanigans so that he could actually get elected to being governor. It's the local election officials also that are part of this scheme and the conspiracy that happens in states. And so I think what it means for the black community and for black women in particular is that we have to be the watchdogs. We have to be at the local level looking to see what these folks are doing because they have figured out how to steal elections. Um, in, and in this year in particular, we will see probably hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people purged from the rolls um, because now um, the Supreme Court has green-lighted people being taken off the rolls just because they did not vote. And so it means that 2020 is going to be a fight. Um, the good thing about black people and black women in particular is that people ain't getting out of line. You know, right. like like <laughs> folks understand. And that doesn't mean that they should, they should stand in that line for four hours. And there are a lot of people who do have to get off the line. This is kind of like part of their scheme is to steal elections, but also to just wear people down, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. If I only give you two machines, mm -hmm. some of you got to go to work. Yep. Right. So mm -hmm. you're going to leave line. Or you have to pick up your kid or get charged a dollar a minute. I remember those days, yep. a dollar a mm -hmm. minute if you're late for pickup at, um, at daycare. And so um, so they do know that the calculation is the harder we make it, maybe some of them won't stand in there. Um, but we do know that black folks actually are not scared of voter suppression, that we will stand up to it. But what it also means is that this go around, we got to be doing early voting. We got to be doing vote by mail mm -hmm. in particular, mm -hmm. um, absentee ballots where we can, um, because the other thing that we need to be scared about is our other countries infiltrating mm -hmm. yeah. our system. Yeah. And so we're right. going to have to go back to paper ballots and pencils um, <laughs> in order to actually no, have true. a it's verified true. vote. Yep. And mm -hmm. our communities in particular have to be ready for it because we are going to be the target not only of those who do not want us to vote because of their party affiliation and their race, but also the countries that do not want us to vote for the same reasons. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine that, other countries mm. infiltrating an election. Yeah. <clears throat> Anyway, so we are going to have to leave it there and move on to our second panel because I'm getting the look from Glenda. Um, but please uh, let me thank you guys. Anybody join me in thanking you all for your wisdom and your insight. Really appreciate it. All badass black women up here. Um, <laughs> so now I'm going to introduce our second panel. Uh, Glenda C. Carr, who you met earlier. She is the co-founder, president, and CEO of Higher Heights for America. Uh, the amazing Congresswoman Marsha Fudge from Ohio. And Adrian Shropshire, executive director of Black Pack. Come on down. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we got to say hello and do our thing before we you know, come that's on. What we do. I know. That's why I'm just saying, hanging out. I'm all right. That's okay. That's all right. This makes me feel like I'm, you know, part of the Senate Intelligence Committee or the House Intelligence <laughs> <Yeah>. Committee. <laughs> um, so I want to kind of pick up where our last. Uh, yes, of course you can. Enjoy. Oh, and L. Joy Williams is going to join the panel, maybe, <laughs> sort of. That's it only me. She's a, uh, <laughs> I'm not taking credit for that. <laughs> Yay! Okay. All right. So, um, I want to build on what the the what we were talking about in the last panel. We've seen these amazing numbers. Uh, we've got to build on that. We've got some real challenges. Obviously, you know, I was actually just in Chicago on Monday. Uh, there's an organization called the IDB Wells Legacy, which is meant to help black women in the way that the uh, Eleanor Roosevelt Legacy tries is for all women. And one, there were a couple of women who, there who are running for office, and one of the things they talked about was just how hard it is to just get to the starting block and get noticed. And I think particularly in this time of social media, to some degree that can make it easier to kind of get yourself out there, 
but also it's really hard because it's such a crowded uh, environment. So I wonder. I wanted to start with just um, maybe Glenda and Elder want to talk about how do we help women get to the get to the starting block. Yeah, but I think you. You know, we are encouraging um, women in For Higher Heights, black women, to step off the sidelines and to run for office. And once we do that, right, we need to actually support them. Um, and in the presidential, you know, um, the run-up to the presidential, which felt has felt like five years, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, the analysis has already shown that we have, it was at one point the most diverse stage, um, debate stage, um, both from gender, race, you know, social economic background, ideologies, um, sexual orientation, that the women on those on the stage actually still got less media mentions than every mm. other person, right? And so some of it is calling out the media around coverage, and that's what um, the Women's Me Media Center has been doing for decades. Um, and they follow the how many words we are being um, covered, how many times are they actually being um, uh, mentioned in news articles and uh, being presented as panelists on our broadcast. So I think one is pushing the mainstream media and our and our other um, non-traditional outlets to ensure that we have equal coverage. Um, and then you know we're on our feeds all the time, according to the national, um, according to the Nielsen um, report. Black women spend three to four hours a day more on social media than the general population. And so how do we just you know empower ourselves to ensure that we are uplifting? the candidates that you are inspiring us or look like us um, in our social feeds. Anybody else want to weigh in on that? Sure. I, you know, I would say one of the reasons why uh, Higher Heights has been effective in supporting um, black women who want to get off the sidelines, as Glenda mentioned, is the first thing, and this is just a, a pure basic civic engagement conversation, is being able to give women the tools and the information about the process. Um, and that is something that is not only isolated for black women and women in general, it is overall people understanding the process of gaining ballot access, of becoming a candidate, what team you need to put to ha have together, sort of those mechanics that is not, we don't just wake up knowing those mechanics. We don't learn those mechanics in school or anything for that nature. All we know is somebody runs for something, right? right. Um, and so for organizations like ours is really empowering people with the information. Um, and being a national organization, it has opened our eyes into how ballot access, how the process is different all across the country and how those differing policies, those different um, way to jump onto the stage um, had creates this, well, that's why we only get a certain candidate. Um, because, you know, that's why we only have wealthy candidates um, running for certain races is because the amount of money that's necessary, that's needed in order to begin such an operation, be it a presidential race or even a gubernatorial race. Mm -hmm. um, and as we're seeing in some of the top 100 cities, which is um, uh, the, some of the races that we cover as well, you're even seeing, even running for mayor um, in these cities is becoming a financial burden. Um, so you have both the financial aspect of helping women to have the resources or know how to um, actually put an operation together to uh, raise the resources, but then just the very basic mechanics um, and civic engagement of the process about how do I get ballot access. People don't know in some places you need signatures and some places is a caucus, right? Yeah. So that breaking down that barrier and empowering people with the information also helps open our eyes about how there are a number of inequities in the system. Congressman Fudge, I'm going to ask you to weigh in because as someone who I know works with candidates, you've been a candidate, <laughs> you are a candidate. <laughs> Don't forget that. Uh, no, it's, in all seriousness, it's sort of it feels like, yes, it's still hard, but it's better in 2020 because we do have more organizations that are out there. Um, although, and this is the kind of the other part of the question I want to ask you, I think the climate in 2020 is under Donald Trump, I'll just say it, is um, very, feel, can feel uh, very racially charged, very, um, and tough for women, frankly. It doesn't feel that way. It is that way. I yeah, mean, that's, well. that's the reality of what it is. <laughs> but I, I would just say this. Um, one of the things I've found when I have helped other candidates, as well as with my own candidacy, is you start out by helping other people. So when you get off the, the, the sidelines, as you say, you don't just get off and say, I'm going to run. 
you get involved in other people's races and other people's campaigns. You know, I'm not a wealthy person. I didn't come from money. So you have to find a way to meet people who have money. Yeah. Because if you don't, you can't win because as a, as, as a general rule, especially people of color, they don't realize how important it is for you to send us that $5 mm -hmm. or that $10. Um, they don't realize how important it is. Let's just talk about Judith's work, which I think that she didn't tell you enough. <laughs> if, 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 if she and others were not doing the work of keeping in front of us the suppression that is going on in this country and letting these people know, I'm going to fight you every day. It would be so much worse. Mm -hmm. And so just educating people, I think, is a big part of it. Um, but the other thing is, unfortunately, and you said it earlier, we do have to work twice as hard. I work twice as hard in Congress every day mm -hmm. because I know that there are a lot of people there who wish that I were not there. But one thing that they cannot do is disrespect me because I do my work and I do it well. And so um, I think that we all have to at some point realize why we're running how to make it work. And the way you make it work is to get involved with other people who have done it or who are doing it uh, or who can show you the way. There comes that um, whole concept of figure out how to put a team together. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you raise the money? Who do you talk to? It comes from being involved. Mm -hmm. You just don't come out one day and say, I'm going to run because I know <laughs> I'm all that. Yeah, you might be. But you have to figure out how to do it and when. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Adrian, did you want to weigh in on that? You do a little bit of this work. Well, I mean, I would say that one of the, the what keeps coming to mind for me in this conversation really is this process of de demystifying, mm -hmm. um, because I think it's demystifying not only for women who want to run, um, but I also think for voters themselves um, and, and understand the, the process, the importance of the process of someone running for office, but also their participation in getting them elected. And I think that one of the challenges that we often have is that not only do women and black women in particular not understand the process for running for office, but we also have voters who don't totally understand all the time the power of the office that they're electing people to. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is, there is, a, there is a civics process um, that um, we don't do enough of in our own communities. And we often say, well, we don't have it in school anymore. And that's true, which means that then we have to pick up that slack somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so I think that for organizations like ours and others, helping uh, folks walk through uh, the process to demystify um, what sometimes seems like very complicated things and then folks learn that it isn't. Um, I, to your point about, you know, like it's, a, or to, to your uh, point also, Congresswoman, the, that it's a fight every day. I think one of the things that we've seen, um, certainly since 2016, um, is that black women are actually up for this fight. Um, and so when mm -hmm. we think about all the elections that have happened um, from 2017, the early 2017 specials, um, to the elections last month, what we know is that black women are up for this fight, um, and including when we think about the efforts and the attempts to suppress our vote and what that looks like in our communities. Um, from the very time that we saw voter suppression laws, voter ID laws coming into practice during the Obama years, what we know is that each year after that, black people actually increased their share of the vote. And a part of that was a response to the audacity of someone suggesting that they have the right to take away our vote. And so I think that as a community, um, black people are up for this fight. Um, and we just have to figure out how we um, make sure that folks have opportunities and ways to, to stay engaged. Can I just say one thing yes, about what you said? When you were talking about they don't know what we do, they have no idea. You know, people, no, people call my office and will say, uh, you know, the dog next door is barking. Can you do I said, no, that's you call your councilman for that. Yeah. Or no, they, but they'll say, well, we call you because we know you'll do it. Exactly. As opposed to calling the people that they think won't. But what they don't know is I'm the person that fights to make sure that their schools have equipment or the person who fights for food stamps. And so when they say that there's no difference between elected officials, it's because they don't know what we do. So I think that's a very, very valid point. We have to make that distinction. So you, I, I know Eldra wants to jump in so quickly, and then I want to go to back to the congressman and talk a if little bit. If you need to go on, you can go Okay. On. So congressman, voter suppression, let's talk about that. A very important piece of legislation. Um, Thank you for fighting for that. Sorry that uh, Mitch McConnell's not going to do anything with it, but <laughs> but let's talk about it because I do think you know you know we talk about how things are going to the graveyard. That's part of our political conversation, but I I do think it's still important that we keep up that fight. And to what you said about Judas work, that people know that we're still fighting it, um, and and 
we know that there is a lot going on sort of outside of government, right, at the local level. You know, groups are trying to take this on uh, in different, I mean, there's obviously national organizations, but I think we're seeing a lot more activity locally to try to, because people are realizing how important this is. Well, I think there are a couple of things, and there are different ways that you approach it. I mean, certainly organizations like Judith's, but, but what, what we did for 10 months is we went around the country. We went to people instead of having them come to us, and we said, tell me what happened to you. Tell me your story. And so that when we put our document together, we were able to say to other members of Congress and the Supreme Court and anybody else who wanted to listen, this is the truth of what is happening. You can spin it any way you want to. And then people will say, well, why would you go through all this if you knew it wasn't going anywhere? Because it's the right thing to do. And, I mean, it's, I'm a former prosecutor. So uh, if I were to charge somebody with a crime and the jury let them off, I wasn't wrong charging them if I thought they did it. What happens later is not my responsibility anymore. Mm -hmm. All my job is is to do what is right. That is what I was elected to do, and that is what I think that we all should do. Uh, but voter suppression is much bigger than people think it is. Um, I live in a county that's about a million four. We have one early voting site, one. To me, that's voter suppression. And, and, and for those people who believe in the Constitution, the Constitution does not say uh, voting is a requirement. It says it is a right. Mm -hmm. uh, it says that uh, there should be nothing that would abridge the right to vote. So that means if you don't use it, doesn't mean you lose it. The Constitution is clear. So purging, to me, is unconstitutional. And I think that's an argument we must make. Uh, not because I believe that Mitch McConnell and, and the people in, in the Senate will do anything with it, but because people need to know we are fighting for their rights mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. And if they don't believe that, they look at us just as another bunch of politicians. They have to know we are fighting for them. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Thank you. And you are. Um, I want to talk about 2020. Um, there's a big elephant in the room. We touched on Kamala um, in the first panel, but here's the, wh the way I want to approach this conversation because I think the what went wrong, who did what to whom conversation has played out. I'm more interested in what I sort of my own personal theory about part of what was going on here. You know, we've seen in poll after poll, um, people want to beat Donald Trump. They're anxious about that. And even, you know, some reporters have gone to Iowa and they're at a Elizabeth Warren event and actually and talk to somebody and they're like, oh actually I'm a Bernie supporter, but I wanted to come over here and just see. Like they're very much still you know, dating, to try to figure out who they're going to support and who, who can beat Donald Trump. What strikes me in this conversation, though, if we look at not just Kamala, but also the challenges that Julian Castro and um, Corey had, whether you agree with them or not, uh, and particularly when it comes to the women candidates and Kamala, is it feels like what voters were saying is, we think that has to be a white man to beat Donald Trump. And I think that's a much more important conversation to have, because as we're trying to elect more black women to more, uh, not you know, congressional office, but executive office, where you really have power. And, there, and we know in our culture, men are afraid of women with too much power. Um, but how do we get around that question? How do we help educate ourselves or kind of turn that back on ourselves to say, we need to see black women as able to be Donald Trump, able to be the president, able to be the governor. We, we're doing it better at the mayoral level, but there's something about this executive power that I think it's t still tough for all women, uh, although, like I said, Hillary Clinton actually did beat Donald Trump. Uh, but it's for black women, it's like it's a double threat. Yeah, I mean, I think if you look at, um, you know, uh, Dr. Uh, Dittmar talked about this in our report, is that black women um, on state executive offices or executive offices, that is where we have our biggest opportunities, but it's also our biggest barrier. So in our country's history, we've only had 15 black women ever elected to statewide executive office. So yes, um, we are making gains on the city um, 
city executive offices. So in 2014, there were only two black women serving as mayors of top 100 cities. We now have seven that are concurrently um, serving. Um, we've partnered with the um, Barbara Lee Family Foundation. They had a report that came out um, a month ago that talked about um, both quantitative and um, qualitative data around um, the electability of women on executive office. And so that research points to that voters um, this is an interesting time from a politically toxic and racially divisive time, but in theory, voters believe that they see black women, see women, and um, particularly the black candidate uh, that they used uh, to shape this data, that they are electable and desirable. But the question becomes, when you then couple, couple that into the current political environment, mm. people can't see past that. Um, and what people are forgetting, I call it revisionist history. So everybody loves Stacey Abrams. She calls me her petty friend because I'm still that person when everyone's like, oh, I'm with Stacey. I'm like, nah. You In May of 2017. You <laughs> right? There was questions in narrative um, shaping around her not being electable and not likable. Yeah. Right? And she ended the year as the most Googled politician in the country, right? And so it is the pathway of going, well, I can't see you as a leader until you're a leader. Where right. we have been, you know, it's the hidden figure piece, like, or my ain't I woman. Uh, black women particularly have been doing this work. Um, and we can't create the self-fulfilling prophecy, as I'm calling, you know, um, the conversation around um, Senator Harris, that she's not electable. Um, so if we continue to say that as black women, as um, as the progressives, as as our nation, then we are now, you know, creating or putting burden on the electorate to be like, well, they're not electable, so therefore we shouldn't even look at them mm -hmm. and support them. I would add on to that that um, a, a little bit more about the phrasing and sort of what voters and um, a, a establishment also considers, quote, electable, mm -hmm. right? Because that also goes into a lot of how we view and how voters view um, someone being electable or being in leadership. There can be a disconnect between being able to perceive a black woman or a woman in general as a leader, partly because they probably recognize the black women and the women that lead in their lives on a daily basis mm -hmm. versus taking it to a state, an elected stage, such as governorship or presidential. But now you have the influx of polls telling you who's electable, mainstream media telling you what determines electability, um, and it could be the popularity or name recognition and things of that nature. But then also donors um, mm -hmm. that are yeah. needed, as mentioned, determining who's electable by who they give money to, mm -hmm. right? So that also shapes you as an individual voter where you may initially say, oh, I like Senator Harris because, you know, because of, of this. And then now a poll comes out that shows, well, only 3% of people, you know, know who are supporting her, even though 37% still don't know or still don't have a, a candidate, right? right? right. Sure. Um, also that money dries up. And even though you may have individually given her $5 or been a subscriber, and like Glenda was sending her money on her, like on a <laughs> monthly basis, right? And there are people that do that. However, Big money people aren't giving her money, so that says something about her electability as well. So we can't divorce, right, the phrasing of electability and what other shadow institutions, media, big donors, and polls, have an impact on voters' thought process that even though you may individually align with their politics, love their career and story, know that she can lead, know that she will take on Donald Trump, you then also have this other operation and these other institutions telling you, no, not really. Mm -hmm. And so that has an impact mm -hmm. um, on electability and the staying power, particularly for candidates of color, but exponentially for black women candidates who have to work 10 times harder to raise that same hundred dollars. Can I just say this? Because yes, I'm going to actually have to excuse myself. Yes, ma'am. Um, until we address the racism and sexism in this country, we can have this conversation over and over again. Nothing is going to change. Um, the only reason Donald Trump was elected is because Barack Obama had been the president. Absolutely agree. Uh, we, need to, we need to accept that fact. 
Uh, when Hillary lost the first time, we realized that the country was more sexist than it was racist. Now it has become more racist than it is sexist again. Uh, but I also just want to say this week, Cory Booker and myself said we, we dropped a bill called the Crown Act mm -hmm. to say that you could not discriminate against women based upon their hair. Something simple. Yeah. My media has been blistering me. Well, why can't we tell people how to wear their hair that work for us? I mean, this is what's going on. I have, I've had interviews. I've got requests for interviews. This is how racist this country is. So they would determine uh, that it is okay to discriminate against black women because we wear natural hair. That's, that's what this is all about. And it started because it started in our military. The military was punishing black women because they had either natural hair or braids. We had to go to the Secretary of Defense to make them change that policy. So we are in 2019 <laughs> talking about how black women wear their hair. That was also a problem with Stacey. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, we you know, a electability for <laughs> some people is what they perceive you look like. Mm -hmm. And all of us up here have been through that. Mm -hmm. So we might as well stop skating it and just deal with the fact that America is a racist and sexist uh, country, and we need to call them out on it. I got to go. Y'all. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Glenda. Thank, Thank you so much. I could not agree. We could not agree more. And I think that's a perfect example of why it's important that black women are at the table, because I don't think if there was a black woman in Congress, we, they would have. Anybody would have thought. You know what? How about some legislation? How about we? we deal with this problem. So um, I'm going to wrap up, but I'm going to ask Glenda uh, for any final thoughts or any other other panelists who have uh, final thoughts uh, as we take a look at this wonderful report that, I, again, I think, you know, the other piece of this is having the data is important because that's how we hold ourselves accountable mm -hmm. to know. Uh, and the one other piece in here that I would just flag that it's not in here, but I think is important is that this cycle, we've also seen more black women in senior roles in campaigns. And part of how we build the leadership pipeline is to have more women who are in those senior, part of it was because we had 20 candidates, so there was a lot of opportunity. <laughs> but, you know, it was great to see so many women able to take that opportunity because obviously the other piece of this, right, is we have to, and this is why I think the data is so important, we have to take the long view and know if this is where we are in 2020, where do we want to be in 2030 and how do we get there? Any thoughts? Any last thoughts? So when we have diverse decision-making tables, those decision-making tables make better choices. And so um, we will see uh, in 2020 a record number of black women running for office. So our report um, points to that uh, there was a record number of black women um, running last year, and it gives an analysis of um, – um, running for primaries versus, you know, making it to the general. There is a lot of work to still be done. Um, but when you support black women, you change the decision-making tables. Um, it is not about just electing black women for black women's sake. Um, so you see in 20, 20, 2019, black women serving in leadership roles um, in bodies of, you know, city councils, state legislatures. Um, you know, we have a majority leader in Virginia now. Um, we have a majority leader in the Senate um, who is a black woman. And so it is important that um, we tell the stories of black women, um, continue to tell the stories of the barriers that exist and the opportunities um, that exist um, for them in elected leadership. I mean, I think uh, I'm, I'm, I'm taking something, joy, I'm going to attribute it to Joy because it's good, but then I'm not going to attribute it to her anymore. <laughs> Is that in history, That's how we do. At least um, honest. history doesn't talk about all of the challenges that um, Shirley Chisholm had in her run for presidency, um, but she's the most, one of the most talked about um, um, presidential candidates in our history, and that is what Kamala Harris will be. Um, people in 15 or 20 years, there will be discussions about um, how she, what she did at the end of the day is in her journey, um, move some obstacles over, um, push some barriers out the way, and has created a pathway, I believe, for the women that are running in 2020 and beyond um, to be able to have an environment where they can truly run, win, and lead. Great, thank you. Anybody? All right, we're going to leave it there. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks to the live feed. I guess the technology worked. That's exciting. Uh, and uh, we'll see you here back 
next year with the next report, or maybe two years. I don't know. Maybe I just committed you to a report next year. <laughs> report Thank every you. Year. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.